Men have tools, and sometimes your tools are not where you had them. I sat down on my workbench just a few minutes ago and couldn't find my tools. So I carried an additional one just in case I didn't know where I put the others. Tonight we're going to ask the question, what does the Bible say about how you and I give? The first job I had as a preacher... I preached with the Ironiton Congregation in Talladega, Alabama. Uh, I, I helped preach with a guy by the name of Cliff Goodwin, and Cliff and I have known each other, I guess, as long as, as far back as I can remember. When we were working there, he had a little boy, a little girl, and a little baby girl. Kinley is the middle, she's the oldest girl. I preached one day and went to the back like we always do to shake everybody out. And uh, she came over there. She may have been nine or ten. And she said, Mr. Billy, I've got to ask you a question. I said, what do you need to ask me, sweetheart? And she said, how does God get it? And I said, I don't have a clue what she's talking about. I said, how does God get what? She said, how does God get our money? I looked her in her little precious face, and I bent down so I could be right eyeball to eyeball with her, and I said, go ask your daddy, because <laughs> I don't know. Her idea is that we have some sort of joint bank account with God, and the money that we give here on Sunday goes into our account, and then on Monday it goes over into his account, and he sort of uses that... Uh, what a really cooker noodle, and for most of us, is the fact that God doesn't need your money. And you think, well, this is the greatest sermon I've ever heard on giving. Preacher's saying you don't have to give. That's not what I said. What I said is God does not need your money to get his will done. It's not a command that we give so that God's will and God's kingdom can continue. The purpose for us of giving is to learn how to do it. A lot of times we meet ourselves right here, and everybody, I guess, within the congregation knows what these two tables are, and we look at them and we say, well, those are the Lord's Supper tables. And that's a true statement. But I wonder how many of us know that actually two items of worship happen at that table, or that the Lord's Supper is not three acts of uh, partaking of the bread, partaking of the fruit of the vine, and the giving. We, we give right there at that time as a matter of convenience. Well, we're already up. We're already passing those things out. Let's, let's pass one more tray and, and kind of be done with, with those two aspects of worship. And then we move on with our worship. What does the Bible say about giving? Can you answer if your friends ask you why you give every first day of the week? And I'm going to tell you this and probably uh, not shock any of you, but the idea of giving on the first day of the week and the first day of every week is not unique to the church of Christ. Matter of fact, everybody, whether they partake of the Lord's Supper, even in the fashion in which it's mentioned of every week, just like the giving, whether they take that or not, they're going to give. Once, and if it's not heavy enough, perhaps we pass it around a second time. Maybe we give before we come in and after we leave. Can you answer the question, why do you give so much? Can you answer the question, could I just not give this week? Is that okay? What does God really expect from me anyway in my giving? Turn over, if, over, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. And let's begin where the church begins, if in fact we are going to follow after the very pattern of God, after the very pattern of the New Testament church that was established on the day of Pentecost after Jesus' death, then we have to go back to where it started. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42. There you read this, and they, those who had already been baptized, those 3,000 mentioned uh, just a verse earlier, and they continued steadfastly or, or 
completely and, and totally focused in the apostles' doctrine, that is, the doctrine given to the apostles by the inspiration of God, Matthew chapter 16, and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods, and they parted them all men as every man had need. And they continued daily and one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to the church those that were being saved. When you look at verse 42 through verse 47, you can find all five acts of worship. Four of them mentioned in verse number 42, and the fifth one mentioned in verse number 47. You have preaching from the apostles. You have giving. In the King James Version, uh, you'll read the word fellowship. That's a communion. That's a, a seeing of needs, and he goes on further to explain that and meeting those needs. You see breaking of bread, what we spoke about last week with the Lord's Supper as it was instituted. You see them prayers in verse number 42, and you say, Ha ha, preacher, but we sing, and that's not found. Move a little further down. Verse number 47, you'll find it. It's the first two words. Praising God. All five actions of worship that we do every single week are found within the structure of the church as it opens its doors in its infancy. And so, if I can't answer the questions, why do you give every week, or why do you give that much, or could I not just give this week, why not? Those have been things that have been happening within the Lord's church since the day the doors opened. Let's notice this. The word cornea in, in verse number 42 is translated as fellowship. It can also be translated as communion or contribution, distribution, or fellowship. As you and I look at, at verse number 42, the first century church gave. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, Paul is given uh, instructions by inspiration to narrow that field of vision for the church in Corinth and then for the, all those who read it. He said, upon every first day of every week, lay by in store as, as you have been prospered. And we're going we're to come back to that, uh, especially the phrase, as you've been prospered. And we're going to look at our giving. But notice this, as they gave and as they continually gave, they looked for people in need. Verse 42, 43, and 44, you can find them, or 43, 44, and 45, you can find them all there looking for someone who would be a member of the church who has a need, where they can have an opportunity to meet that need. One of the reasons why we give is because we have needs. Let's see here real quick. According to my little uh, weather deal here, 43 outside and rainy. That's no good. What if you didn't have heat? Would you come here? Let me tell you something, a building this size gets mighty cold if it doesn't have heat. Would you come here and worship God if we didn't have heat? What if our pews weren't padded? What if we didn't have song books? What if we didn't have any class material? What if there was nobody who came up to us and asked us for things from the community? One of the reasons why we give is because we need to meet the needs of the congregation and those around us. We like to have heat. That's a good thing. We like to have air conditioning in the summer. That's an even better thing. We like to have our class material, don't we? Yes. We like to be able to take those things home and study those. We like to be able to meet the needs of those from the community who come up and say, listen, I'm X amount of months behind on my power bill. I don't know if, if it does for you, but it makes me feel so good when I can help someone out and I know I can help them out. One of the reasons why we give is, is so that we can meet the needs of fellowship, or meet the needs of distribution amongst ourselves and those from the community who are needy. There's an art to giving. It's not just, I'm going to put something in the plate, because if, if I don't, you know, the people on the road beside me are going to see me not put anything in, 
And, you know, that's not going to look good, so I have to put something in there. There's an art to this. And as we look at it, I want you to see how easy it is. There's an art to giving correctly. We give, first of all, because it's commanded. Every first day of the week. Every first day of every week. And then there's this phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And the phrase is this. As we have prospered. Or as God has blessed us. Really is how we would uh, more accurately read. God blesses people in different ways. And in different reasons. And I don't have to know the reasons. We're not even going to take a chance and look at the, the check that comes in from your job. Put that off to the side. We look at that and we say, well, how much do I have to give? Which is a great question. Do I have to give? You want me to give I'll tell you, let's take a side note right here. Let me give you the correct answer to how much do I have to give. All right, now this is going to be harsh, but listen. How much do I have to give? Nothing. You don't have to give a penny you don't have to go to heaven either. Let that sink in. All right. As I have been prospered, let's put that check uh, over here for a moment. And let's think of how the, the ways God has prospered me without income. You know, I have a healthy wife and two healthy, healthy children. You know, I have a healthy wife who cooks for me which is excellent is that a blessing shake your head this way you know how much health I have within my body is that a blessing shake your head this way now older generation I need you to do me a favor and teach this younger generation the, the, the proper amount that a person should give just on the basis of being healthy. What is your health valued at? Hmm. We'll spend all the money that we have to get back healthy, won't we? Oh, sure. Oh, I've been diagnosed with this, or I've been diagnosed with that, but we're going to make those things the necessary corrections so that I can get back to 100% healthy or as close to that as I possibly can. What's that worth? Do you know, I read an article this past week that uh, 16,000 people have passed away within our nation because of the flu this year. I don't know if that number is correct or not. That's the number I read in there. What's your health worth? Just your health. We haven't gotten to all the things that God blesses us with other than just health. What's it worth? The art of giving correctly is that we give as we have been prospered because it's command. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, uh, that whole treatise there on those two chapters is about how we give. And in verse 8, or chapter 8, verses 5 through 9, Paul would write by the inspiration of God that the way I give proves my sincerity and my love to God. Stop right there. Think of that statement. God has proven himself time and time and time again by blessing me, by, by sending the Christ, by giving me time to be obedient. And how do I show back to him? I give back to him because I love him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, the art of giving correctly shows us the idea of sowing and reaping and purposing within my heart. How many of you have ever had a little garden spot? All right, how many of you have ever had a big garden spot? All right, in a medium-sized garden spot. Or a raised bed where you had two tomato plants, that counts. You know, if I, if I have a raised bed out behind my house and I put three tomato plants in there and they grow and they begin to be big and strong, would it amaze you if when they began to, to produce fruit, I told you they produced okra? I have the only tomato plants in the world that produce okra. 
That would be an outstanding thing to see. The idea of sowing and reaping says this. I sow what I want to have return, right? I'm going to put tomatoes in. I'm not going to, wait a minute, I'm not going to put tomatoes in the ground. I don't want tomatoes. Um, I put corn in the ground because I want corn back, right? Not only do I put that in the ground because I want it back, as I, as I look at sowing and reaping, I'm going to get more than I put in the ground. From what I understand, you can get about four or five ears of corn off a corn stalk, if you're lucky. How many ears of corn did I put in that hole? And you say, preacher, you didn't put any ears of corn. You just put one corn kernel. That's right. You'll go ahead and count the kernels on those five ears and tell me what your production rate was? My father-in-law has a garden I think from spring till spring, he's always, come over here and pick this. Come over here and pick that. And his car garden is constantly producing because when one set of plants dies, he plants something else. What an interesting idea. Why? Because he didn't have anything? No, because he wanted some more. Because other people needed those things, and as he's sowing and reaping, the things that he's planting, he's receiving. He's receiving more than what he planted. Notice this. He's going to receive... And as we plant, we're going to receive longer than it took us to plant it. So, and the idea of sowing and reaping, we're going to get back what we plant. We're going to get more than what we planted. We're going to get it longer than what we planted. But it's necessary to plant in order to get it. Look at Luke chapter 15, or 16, verses 1 through 5. The parable of the uh, servants here. Jesus said, as he's speaking about that, that there was a servant who was faithful in a little thing. And God would make him ruler and faithful in much. If we're going to give correctly because it's commanded, we also need to know this. Once we begin to sow and once we begin to prove our sincerity, once we prove to God that we are faithful with small things, you look out because he's going to give you bigger things. But he's not going to give you those bigger things until... You proved you can handle it. And so, the art of giving correctly, we give, first of all, because it's commanded. We give because we've been blessed. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, you may have the catalyst of it. Look right here, as Peter writes, in 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse number 10 beginning, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do so as, the, as of the ability of God, uh, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. In verse 10, there, there, is, a, there is a plea to mankind who is, who is uh, trying to desperately do what God would have him do. He said, you do those things in accordance to God's will. And God will bless you. How about that? You live that faithful life unto God and, and God will bless you. When Brandy and I were growing up in the youth group we were in, about once every couple of months, maybe once a quarter, we lived in a, in a tiny town, by the way, that would fit inside this auditorium. And at once every quarter, we would go to a one of the, or, or a couple of the shut-ins homes who were shut in from uh, being able to come to worship with us, and we'd go uh, take the youth group of 40 or so and go and sing. And, you know, have a time just to kind of uh, fellowship with them and enjoy the company and, and have our faces seen by them because they knew us since we were this little bitty and they haven't seen us in quite a while because we're teenagers and we don't go to shut-ins houses unless somebody says, hey, let's go to a shut-ins house, and you go, well, that's a pretty good idea. We would always go to this fellow who lived about two or three blocks away from the church. He and his wife lived in a little one-room almost house. They had a, a little bitty bathroom and then a kitchen off to the side of even the, the one room that they lived in. He was poor as dirt. And inside his house, whether it was July or January, it'd be 150 degrees. 
And you'd go in there and you'd start singing and you would try to move your way over toward the door so that you could crack it open just a little bit and get some kind of breeze. It was so, so hot. They looked forward to that. And, you know, when we, when we were doing it, I never really understood why they looked forward to, to having all those people cram in their house. And I never understood why they looked forward into having us come sing. And you know, every time they'd cry, and I, don't, I didn't know why that was. Here's a man and a woman who understands or understood the, the blessing of, of having brothers and sisters in Christ. Blessing of having them come by and, and see you and take care of the needs that you may have. And while their need was not anything dealing with money, you know what they needed? Visits. People to care about them. You know what you need? Visits and People to care about you. We give to God because God gives to us repeatedly. And sometimes we forget about how blessed we are. Matt made mention this morning uh, during the, the giving unto our Lord this morning that we are the most blessed nation within the world. If you don't think that's true, spin a globe and stop it somewhere and fly there and find out. you'll not believe how incredibly blessed we are financially until you go outside of the borders of our nation. And we are blessed beyond measure. Sometimes we're blessed so much that we take those things for granted and that we're pulled away by what we would consider blessings that Satan would consider temptations. Giving because we've been blessed, brethren, needs to be the catalyst of how we give. Because I've been blessed, because I, I have been given so much, it's necessary that I give something back. It's necessary. Notice this. The art of giving correctly, we give correctly because we want to be godly. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, God says, I've given you all things that pertain unto life and unto godliness. We give because we want to be godly. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we're told to be godly, that we're not to transform to this world, that we're supposed to be different from those things that are conforming here, that we are supposed to be uh, a godly and holy people. And notice this. You want to define godly? That's an easy one, preacher. That's, that's godlike. Yes, that's godlike in every aspect. Now turn over to John chapter 3 and verse 16 and see how godly you can be. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now go ahead and raise your hand if you're ready to give up your children for the world. I don't have to give all of them, just one. You want to give that way? Well, I'm not ready to give that way, preacher. You're not ready to be godly. Oh. That's a harsh statement, isn't it? It's not about if I'm willing to give a child or not. It's about what my mindset is of how to be godly. Would you give something to someone? Even if you knew they were not going to use it? What if you thought they were not going to use it properly? Brandon and I were approached last week in the Kroger parking lot by some lady. And she said, I'm hungry. I pulled the, I didn't have much liquid cash in my pocket, but I, whatever I pulled out, I gave to her and said, here. Now, what if she had taken that and, brethren, there's a principle here we need to, to fixate ourselves on. And here's the principle. It's my job to give. It's her job to use it properly. I'm not going to stand in judgment for how she used that money after I gave it to her, but I'll guarantee you I'll stand in judgment if I gave it to her or not. You want to be godly? Give. You want to be like Christ? Give. I, I don't know any other way to put that. If you want to be like God, if you want to be like Christ, give. Notice this. And perhaps you're saying, 
Boy, this, this sermon started out good, but it's turned on us now. All right, preacher, how much? How much? In the religious world, you'll hear a phrase called the tithe. You know where that comes from? That comes from the Old Testament system of law. And we see it and think of it as 10%, and it really wasn't 10%. It was a little more than that. It was 10% of everything that they owned all the way down to the yeast they had in their house. And it was for the perpetuation of the, the nation of Israel and for the perpetuation of the tabernacle, the temple. Knowing all of that, knowing that that uh, group of the children of God in the Old Testament gave about 10, 12, 15 percent, somewhere around there. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews, the Hebrews writer will constantly make a comparison of the Old Testament law and call it the law unto the New Testament dispensation under which we live and call it the faith. So don't, don't be confused when you run into those words there in Hebrews. The law, Old Testament, the faith, New Testament. Now notice this. Verse 1 in chapter 10. For the law, that Old Testament, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of of the things can never, with those sacrifices which were offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto too perfect. For then they would have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. Here's the reason. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. How much? Well, I know what the Old Testament children were required to give. And Hebrews will tell us, living underneath that Old Testament law, they didn't have the advantage of salvation the way you do. They would roll those things forward. All of those animals that passed away, or not passed away, all those animals that died as sacrifice in the Old Testament did so as a place marker until Jesus could get on that cross and die. How much, preacher? Uh, whatever you got. However much salvation is worth. How much money would you, save, would you pay to save your body? How much money would you pay to save your soul? Brethren, it ain't about that. You can't pay enough money to save your soul. You can't work enough to save your soul. You can't live right enough to save your soul. But it is necessary to live right, to give to God, to work in God's kingdom in order to be faithful to it. We have an old saying back home where they say, give to it hurts. And our mindset needs to change on that. Our mindset really needs to be give till it feels good. Maybe you say, I can't give anything, preacher. Is that right? You know what we've, what we've focused in here uh, really on this particular lesson has been how we give when we find ourselves here. Perhaps it is the case, financially, that someone cannot. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, God said, I'm going to only ask you what you can do. We have yet to talk about giving of our time, giving of our self. There's a lot of other ways to meet the commandment of God other than just putting money in the plate. But as we look at this idea, I need you to know this. Are, are you afraid? Are you scared you might not get it back? 
I moved a girl from the same house she lived in all her life to Memphis, Tennessee. That's a scary move. And when we had opportunity to go through the Memphis School of Preaching, you had to sign a contract. The contract said you'll go to school for eight hours a day. You'll study for another eight hours a day outside of school. You, you won't have time to have a job. With that third eight hours, you can do whatever you want to with it. I'd suggest sleep. I didn't have a job for two years. I had a, I guess in the secular world it would be called an internship, where I worked with a local congregation and one of our instructors and was taught the ins and the outs of the actual day-to-day -day work of a preacher. And we had a budget going to Memphis, and we stripped that thing down I mean, to the bare bones, I think we needed about six bucks a month to live. I mean, it was, it was tiny. And what we had to do was go around and ask different congregations, would they sponsor us X amount of dollars a month and allow us to, to uh, do this work and come out and preach? And we went to a bunch of congregations, a bunch of them. And if you looked at the money that was uh, promised every month, and you looked at the budget, the bottom line of the budget, they were worlds apart. They were never the same number. And if, for any of you who like math and are number people, if the number that you need ain't the number you're getting, you're going to do what we call back home is fall in the hole. And it ain't going to take very long, is it? Here's what we found out. There was some lady who was probably a widow somewhere every month. Different ones from different places. And they'd write you a nice little note and a little card that said, just thinking about you, and here's 50 bucks. Woohoo! We were rich. And every single month, the budget was met. How does that happen? The answer even to this day, some 16 years later, is, I don't know. It just happened. Are you afraid God can't provide for you? You afraid that he won't provide for you? you? Afraid that he doesn't have enough? Doesn't know enough? Can't do enough? The problem with, most of the time, with our giving and putting those things in the plate is we don't have enough trust in God. Give back to him. He'll give it to you. He doesn't need it anyway. What he wants to know is, are you willing to give everything you have since he gave everything he had? And unfortunately, most of the time, the answer he gets back from the church is, no, we're not. Okay, preacher, how much? If you're giving the same $25 you've been giving for the past 40 years, you need to look at yourself. I heard an outstanding lesson, and I'm taking this phrase and this point from it. Our giving to God was never meant to be static. It was never meant to be stationary. It was never meant to be, all right, it's 1989, I'm going to give God 20 bucks, which seems to be a lot, and here it's 2020, I'm going to still give him that $20. Because I've not ever paid off a house or a car. or I've not ever paid off any bills. I've never gotten a raise. Raise your hand if you're in that boat. Mm-hmm. But we still want to give them the same amount. Our giving was never meant to be static. As you have been prospered. And unfortunately, that's just the hem of the garment. 
We haven't talked about time. We haven't talked about self. We need to learn. As we learn from every action of worship, we need to learn how to give properly. We give of ourselves. We give everything that we can because God is a gracious and good God. And when we, as the Christians in America, learn how to give because of the blessings that we have, once we learn how to give of our money, then we can apply those principles to our time. We can apply those principles to ourselves. And really, that's where we need to be. You don't have, you don't have the right to give God anything if you first haven't give him, given Him yourself. You don't have the right to give God anything until you have first surrendered your life to Him. Until you have first put on Christ in baptism. Until you've heard what He has to say, until you believe that, until you repent of your sin and confess that Jesus is the Christ, until you're baptized and a member of His family, you don't have the right to give God anything. But after that, not only do you have the right, now your eyes are opened to what things have been given to you, and you have now the responsibility to give unto him the way that he gives to me, the way that he provides for me. Have you put on Christ in baptism? If you haven't, today is a very good day for you because you can, here in just a few moments, become a member of the family of God. If you have done those things and yet you find yourself kind of slack maybe in the, in the giving department, it might not be the fact that you need to come here and tell everyone. It might be the fact that you need to say to self, self, we're going to get this thing under control and in the right fashion and I'm going to start giving correctly. Because it's what God expects and it's what God deserves. But if you find yourself... Uh, being out there in a public setting and, and being opposed to God. Brother or sister, you find yourself in a hog pen. Why not come back home? Why not do it right now while we stand and sing for your encouragement? Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of